Welcome to Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis, your host. Good morning, Houston. Good morning, Harris County. Good morning, Texas. Good morning to the United States of America. And of course, we cannot leave out. Good morning to the world. You know, we are listened to all over, my peeps. We are listened to all over. Welcome to Monday. I trust that all is fine with you guys, or whether you're driving, whether you're just getting up in the morning, getting that first that first sip of coffee. Hey, guys, we're going to have a great show for you today. But before we get started, of course, we go into the heart of KPFT, the control room with Howard Reynolds and Jack Van Beber. How are my two favorite people doing this morning? Well, the heart is beating strongly, and welcome to all the folks on the borderline of Texas and Louisiana, as we know our signal goes there. Yes, we did. In fact, you were driving out there when you actually said, hey, it's coming in. And even when you crossed the border, there were Mm -hmm. big patches that you actually got it, right? Yeah, yeah. For all the folks who are in one of those patches right now, you're hearing my voice from Houston, Texas. And this is the Alberto Willie Show. Politics <laughs> done right. All right, listen to you. Hey, Jack, what's up, my dear brother? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, I thought we were going to do the box thing, so I did a little writing on that one. Uh, let me hear. Let, let me hear the box thing because you know oh. I really love the box thing. And yes, we're going what to the do box thing the is. box thing. The He's box thing you. is a box they've been building to entrap us in in an economic chaos. Well, <laughs> looks like they've won. Yeah. Well, you know, in 1960, Dwight D. Eisenhower gave his ex speech where he warned us about the growing influence of the military industrial complex. I believe that at the end of World War II, after they had divided up the world between the victors, the capitalists saw what a sweet deal and how an economic system that favors the wealthy would work for them. So they decided to bring it to the U.S. They've been building an economic box to trap the people in, and it's built by big business, the corporate fascists, and the power they have over the politicians via the Supreme Court. Uh, No wonder they call it the big box stores. The big box stores. (laughs) It's got to be what it is. Well, this is this is this is my my working theory of what's going on today. And uh, look, you're right. You know, it's you know, ever since uh, Eisenhower, they've been little by little doing things, deregulating things for business. Uh, you know, uh, basically making dirty deals in other countries and holding their countries hostage, and. It's just not right, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. They're robbing us blind, Jack. Yes. You know, when Reagan came in, Uh, the the neocons came in, and they started right in on tearing tearing down the regulations for business. And now big business is so strong, I don't even know if we can jerk back on them anymore. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And that's why I love when you talk about uh, actually, on on Friday uh, you had mentioned about the crack, the tear in the box. I don't remember you called it a crack or a tear or open in the box. I don't remember how you said it, but the, you know, the, I had the lid is closing. The lid is closing at this time, and we better do something about it. Exactly, and you know something. I am glad. First of all, I'm glad that uh, I think it, uh, Howard just said something to the effect. You know, are you that they're closing it in such a manner that we can't open it? To which I said, mm-hmm. "Yeah, they're closing it." But you know what? Uh, this morning, uh, Howard and Jack, I saw this article, and you know, when you read an article, that it kind of just sent warmth through your body because uh, I'm going to tell you the title of it, and and I'm saying this before I go into the newsletter on the show because that's how. I wanted to start the show. And the title of the article was, Could Two Working Class Candidates Return Nebraska and West Virginia to Their Roots? And I don't know, all of you remember West Virginia. 
who was uh, who was this state that was a very democratic state. And I'm, I'm not even one caring about it being democratic per se, being in party, but it was a working class state. It was a state that that, you know, people worked hard. A lot of times they were taken, taken advantage of, but they work hard and they, you know, you could you could get them to vote on your values. And then the other state is Nebraska, right? Nebraska, another hard uh, working state. And these guys are fully, firmly in control of the Reds, right? But even when they were uh, recently in control of the Blues, because we can't forget that Joe Manchin is from West Virginia, and all the po- most of the policies that Joe Manchin, who's a Democrat, supports, is anathema to West Virginia. In other words, all the things that West Virginians need. That's why a couple of a couple shows ago, I asked all of you to watch the poorest nation, the poorest part of the United States. It's a documentary with this guy who drove into West Virginia. And you see that documentary, you can't help but sympathize with these people and understand what they're going through and get upset at Democrats for not going into these areas and talking to the people which makes them that many times, I'm saying all the times, many times, that East, East Coast and West Coast party that to some of these people, even though we know it's not so for progressive Democrats, for most of these people, they're just flyover states that nobody respects, nobody cares about, and we're living through the results of that. When I talk about we have to engage everybody, we have to love on everybody, we have to give everybody value. These are the kinds of things I'm talking to. But there comes a story. Could two working class candidates return Nebraska and West Virginia to their roots? When we do this program, we complain a lot. We are like, this is wrong. This is happening. This is happening. And eventually, if you keep listening to programs that just tell you, um, that, that just tell you what's wrong, what is the damn point? If you can't come out and say, these are all the things that are wrong, but that box that Jack Van uh, Barber, (laughs) Jack Van Beber, I was saying Jack Van Barber, forgive me, sir, that Jack Van Beber is talking about, we can't let it close. In fact, we got to bust it wide open and we still can bust it wide open. So as you listen to Jack, make the case as you listen to howard make the case as we make these cases and we complain about these issues one when howard says vote 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 is not a cliche it's something that we got to do but we got to vote correctly we have to vote for the right people we can't we can't just go there and believe the crappy commercials that very many times easy to believe but aren't very much factless or very much not truthful so we can make a difference so what so when we talk about uh, here on this program when we talk about these problems we're also going to talk about hey but it doesn't have to be that way and no absolutely no we can still make a difference we don't have the dictator in power yet you know, it's going through my, um, before I get to the article, I was going through my tweet channel today and Mehdi Hassan said the biggest, the biggest concern he has is when he listens to people talk about, uh, you know, Trump coming back in power and saying things like, uh, you know, maybe it won't be so bad as if their resolve is gone and saying if he comes back into power, uh, Maybe it won't all be so bad. He, he, he cut a piece of uh, Al Gore on CNN yesterday saying, please, folks, realize that it's not going to be that bad. It's going to be likely worse than you think. It'll likely be worse than you think. I mean, it's bad enough the way things are right now w- with respect to the, the poor and, and lower middle class moving forward. But it, there's a lot worse to get. There's a lot more crack in that box that jack van bever is talking about that needs to close i mean that needs to be torn open so 
two guys, one in Nebraska and one in West Virginia, says, no, let's get back to some of our roots here. And it goes like this. The article, the major parties on Capitol Hill like to boast about how much more representative their congressional delegations have become in recent years. But that's only in the most discussed categories of diversity, race, age, gender, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Working class Americans rarely end up in the halls of Congress. Fewer than 2% of Congress members had working class jobs at the end of at the end at the time they were elected. And let me remind you of this group in Congress known as the Squad. Progressives, the Squad. Look at where Summer Lee is from. Look at where AOC is from. Look at where Ayanna Presley is from. Look at where uh, Jamal Bo- uh, Bo- Bowden is from. Look at where Cory Bush is from, somebody who slept in her car and was homeless. Uh, AOC, who once also was in dire straits as she uh, uh, did that. We look at Rashida Talib, Ilan Omar, working class folks that understand the people, the biggest fear in the Congress. People that have been getting the attack from the plutocracy because they fear the working pla- class growing up. Uh, Crystal Ball was supporting a West Virginian a few years ago. I met her in at a conference, uh, a Netroots conference in uh, I think at that time it was, uh, I think it was Rhode Island that, that, that the conference was at and working class. And he came close to defeating the person that ran against mansion, the young woman that ran against mansion that came close to making a difference. The people, the, the, the people are, the, are, are starting folks to make a difference. The people are starting to make a difference and they can. Ah, yes. And they can. I need to open that screener. I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, The people can make a difference. So two working class candidates hope to improve those numbers next year. And notice who I called out thus far. By winning U.S. Senate seats in Nebraska and West Virginia, states currently represented by anti-labor politicians, but which were once bastions of a more populist pro-worker politics. So again, these were pro-worker states, believed in unions and all these things. Then the Reds came into power. And to some extent, the, the moderate blues came into power. And where did it take them? Where did it take them? They lost that power. In Nebraska, former bakery workers leader Dan Osborne is challenging two-term Republican Deb Fisher, and he leads in a poll commissioned by Nebraska Railroaders for Public Safety. So you know that the ads are going to come to slice him up in a minute. Osborne is a steam fitter from Omaha who helped lead a successful strike by 1,500 Kellogg workers. They shut down plants in four states for 11 weeks in 2021. In West Virginia, Zach Shrewsbury is also running for U.S. Senate. He's a military veteran, a community organizer, and the grandson of coal miners. Shrewsbury hopes to replace multimillionaire Joe Manchin by preventing Governor Jim Justice, a billionaire coal baron, from claiming the seat that corporate Democratic, that corporate Democrat is vacating. And we can't forget that billionaire Jim Justice at one time used to be a popular Republic, I mean Democrat in the state of West Virginia till he switched parties under Trump, uh, made a big issue out of it back in the 20, I think it was 2018 or something like that. Populist voices in their respective campaign launches last fall, both candidates sounded themes once familiar to voters in their home states in the heyday of progressive populism, but not heard much of lately. And they don't hear this populism neither from Democrats or Republicans. In fact, what you find is even Democrats are trying to shut down progressives. That's why here in Harris County, we have the posse that is really starting to reclaim what it is. Unfortunately, 
uh, the mayor's race, which we can kind of talk a little bit about uh, uh, later on, uh, had some big problems. But we'll talk about that later. While picketing with striking General Motors workers in Martinsburg in October, Shrewsbury explained that he's running to win and show that working class people can run for office, even high office. We can't be ruled by the wealthy elite who don't understand everyday American life. And that is the issue. I talk about all that all of the times, not only within the Republican Party, but within the Democratic Party. Think about this election we just had in Houston. Let me stop this article and talk a little bit about the election in Houston from all the folks that are out here. This is reflected all over the country. The, the, the amount of people that voted was horrendous. OK, very anybody could have won the election based on the people that are running. But there's something that happened that I mentioned when we spoke on Thursday to Neil Aquino, two Thursdays in a row. We know Houston is a progressive city, a blue city, a city where it's very ethnically diverse. People, uh, uh, if you go to any place in Houston, you watch a flood in Houston. And on these particular occasions, people's humanity usually shows up. Their progressivity usually shows up. I don't know if that's a word, but I said it. I don't know if that's a word, but it shows up. But here we have this election. And as I mentioned with Joe uh, to Aquino, when we had our program, watch what's going to occur. We have democratic politicians triangulating. And when you triangulate in a, in a very majority democratic city, a progressive city like this, the only people that lose are the average Democrat, the progressives. And that is exactly what happened in this election. A democratic city. Remember, single districts Single member districts usually are made to kind of get folks in that area elected. So you can't gerrymander sing. Uh, you can you can't generate gerrymander at large seats, but you can gerrymander those little seats. So it wasn't too bad. The election wasn't too bad, even though it people didn't show up in those districts. But where you saw the change was at large. At large, this progressive city sent more Republicans on city council when all the people together voted than it sent Democrats. There are five at large uh, seats in this, this city, and three of them went to Republicans. On her, that is completely, completely against what the city stands for. And you may say, well, why did that happen? Well, we had the Democrat on the top of the ticket uh, working specifically with Republicans and the Democrats stayed their butts at home. And the ones who should be campaigning as if there was no tomorrow did not. And exactly what we said would happen happened. You won't see it announced that way. They're going to still tell you, well, the majority of city council is democratic, <clears throat> but it's not nearly as democratic. It's not nearly as progressive as it should have been because those who should have worked to make sure that the people know that their voices were at stake, that they would have had a voice, didn't see it fit enough to get their people out to vote. They were complacent, they were lazy, and in effect, the Republicans who worked their butts off to win in a progressive city, and they won't tell you that they won, but I'm telling you right now, Houston is no longer, it, it's still a progressive city, nothing has changed, but Houston is now run by Republicans. You're going to say, but Whitmire is a Democrat. Look at the record. We've been talking about that and talking about that and talking about that. And, and we allowed a Democrat to triangulate. We allowed a Democrat to use Lee Atwater effects 
to demonize somebody, to bring out the carnality of many, to get somebody elected, that when it comes to where the progressive nature of this city is supposed to be, will not. Corporate city, corporations will reign for the next four years. Because do remember, this is a strong mayor city. But great that too, that a West Virginian, a West Virginian and a uh, and a, uh, a, a, West, a West Virginian and a Shrewsbury person is going to change, is going to work to change, to say, no, we have values. We can make a difference. Anyway, uh, folks, I'm, I'm going to start taking calls whenever you want the calls to come in. I have a lot of material to cover, but I'm feeling I want to hear from you from the beginning this morning. I'm feeling you right now. 713 526 Five seven three eight. I got a lot of other material to cover that you guys can go to our newsletter and read at uh, uh, politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. But I would love for people to call in and tell me how you feel about the election, how you feel about this article that was prompted by, uh, by Jack Van Bever's Tear the Box Open. 713-526-573. Give me a call. 713- Five two six five seven three eight. I'll take as many calls as come in, but I need you to call. Please don't wait till the end of the program. I'm going to continue with that uh, that article in a minute. I need to get a process started that I forgot to start uh, to get some of the people on internationally. But folks, uh, stick with me. Seven one three five two six five seven three eight. Hit the number two to get on air right away. Why don't you call me right now? Seven one three five two six five seven three eight all right um so uh at the campaign kickoff event late september osborne who's running uh, denounced the monopolistic corporations that actually run this country and pledged to bring together workers farmers ranchers and small business owners across nebraska around bread and butter issues that appeal across party lines. So you see what he's doing. He's saying something that we talk about all of the times. Most of us, most of us, whether you're Houstonians, Texans, Americans, Georgians, Mississippians, whoever you are, more of us have stuff in common than Republicans alone have in common or Democrats alone have in common. Most of us have most everything in common. And the small amount of people that are manipulating these parties, the the small number of people that are putting us, that are pitting us against each other, have, again, they don't have anything in common with us. I, I usually get a particular group upset. When I say, and, and you know, I've said this many a times, and I do this just to show a contrast. Who do you think Oprah Winfrey would have rather have lunch with, me or Donald Trump? You figure that out. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to a, a few people over the weekend, and we we're talking about uh, all these mega stars, right? And how all these people adore these mega stars and uh, earlier and it came from a discussion we had here on friday with uh talking about taylor swift and i did go do a little bit about taylor swift and i love that taylor swift is really getting uh really engaged politically you know there's taylor swift who's worth a billion there's beyonce who's worth a billion as well and you know i i want to see these uh these stars with all this money that they got from singing and shaking their butts on stage to say, I want to make a difference for this country that has made me wealthy. I want to see them engage. I want to see them throwing a lot of their monies at progressive organizations that are trying to give people a break, that are trying to save politicians to give people a break. Well, I did find out that at least uh, Taylor is doing some of that. But my question to all the rich people out there, how many of them do you see come out and say, I abhor Donald Trump. And because I abhor Donald Trump, I will start to invest my money in organizations that 
or fighting to ensure people are educated enough not to put a dictator in office. How many of them are doing that? How many of those stars and those people that you love that are multimillionaire that you that you are always fighting for to keep their tax breaks based on the people you elect? How many of them are out there doing stuff to make this a better country, a more equitable country? Not many. Very few. And when I use that example, who will Oprah have dinner with me or Donald Trump? That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about. 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. So back into solutions. I am happy that we have two working class people working in two working class red states that will be, they, one of them is running as an independent. The other one is running as a Democrat, but each one of them, and, and by the way, the independent in Nebraska is ahead in the polls right now. Not that polls mean much right now. I mean, he probably hadn't gotten the, the alarm bell hasn't gotten off at the RNC yet to really lay down the big guns on him yet. But man, if you can get an early start and get people to have confidence in you and get people to know you're going to be there for them, I just know that that box that Van Bever is talking about can be busted wide open and we can retake what's ours. We can take, we can not retake, but we can take what is in fact our birthright, uh, which is freedom and the access to success. I didn't say the surety of success, but the access to success. 713-526-5738. My brothers and sisters, do not wait until the end of the program to call. Well, to, according to today's newsletter that I send out every day before the show at five in the mornings, the title of the show is supposed to be Gangsta Texas AG Paxton Threatened Doctors. The economic soft landing, Venezuela's Maduro screw up. I'm pretty sure I won't get to all these topics. But you can always find them at politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter with the appropriate links to the videos and stories. That's politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. So what I'm going to do, since I haven't got any calls, now there's going to be a seven-minute window because I'm going to play the first video I prepared, prepared for the show. And then I'll be right back with you. This is a seven-minute piece that I did last night. Well, 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 the phone is ringing, so I'll hold off with the video before I get to the phone. 713-526-5738. If you guys remember all the videos in the, that I'm doing here, you can find in the newsletter at politicsandright.com slash newsletter, which I send out every single morning at five in the mornings. Uh, that if you're on my mailing list by signing up, you'll get the newsletter every single morning of what we're going to be talking about. But before I get to the video, let's go ahead and bring Augie into the fold. Augie, come on in. 713-526-5738. Hit extension 2. You'll be on air right away. Come on in, folks. It's your show. Augie, talk to me. Good morning, geniuses and around the world and Louisiana and Texas. Um, yeah, that box that Jack was talking about was a box that was slowly made. In World War II, when FDR was running for his last term, uh, a bunch of people came to his office told him they weren't going to vote for him unless that made the one percenters pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. It was the workers that were paying taxes. It was the ones that were sacrificing the rubber and tin and everything else when they were sacrificing their nylons. But on top of that, besides taxes, they were also buying war bonds. And they realized the one percenters weren't contributing. So they told the, the socialists, the communists, and the union workers got together. And the representatives told that, y'all, we're not going to vote for you this next time unless you make them pay their taxes. So we got them together, the DuPonts and um, the, even the Bushes and, uh, and others, and told them, hey, guys, you got to pay taxes. Everybody else is paying taxes. You got to pay taxes. And they weren't too happy about that. So they asked him how much. He said 100%. After and that sucked the air out of the room. <laughs> he told me he was joking, and it was like more like ninety five percent. And so they reluctantly went along with it. And then when FDR died and the war was over, 
they all got together and said, man, we got to get rid, uh, get back with these against these union guys, the socialists, and the communists. And so they got smart, they got experts, and they went against them slowly. And that's when the box started being created slowly. So slowly, most Americans didn't even notice. They went Amen. after the communists first. That, that's why we had the McCarthy hearings. They went after the actors, the professors, anybody, the uh, progressives. And then uh, after they got rid of a bunch of communists, they got the Americans stoked up against communists. Then they went after socialists. And uh, then they went after unions. And that's when unions started going down because they were, the, the rich folks are smart. They hire real good people to attack. And uh, like one of your guys that calls in, I forget who it was, Manuel or Barry, uh, said they liked uh, these Republican politicians. They had cojones. No, they don't have cojones. They're barkers. They're attack dogs for the millionaires. And uh, they give them the scripts. They're lobbyists. Even write the laws that uh, we elect the representatives to write. And uh, so, yeah, slowly th- this box enveloped us without people even knowing about it. Right. But, uh, I am glad. I am glad you uh, reminded us about what occurred in the twenties, the thirties, and the forties, because I mean, uh, you know, uh, as people started to realize that, I always talk to folks about why progressives are such under attack because. As progressive enlightened, right? As people started to under, you know, the biggest question, um, the biggest question, uh, Augie, that I've asked everybody to ask themselves every time you go into work, look around at your working brothers and sisters, look around, look around. That place doesn't exist without any of you, whether you're in a coal mine. Whether you're behind on a garbage truck, you know, when, let, let me tell you, Augie, I, um, I, and I repeat this all the time, but we always get new callers, but I'm an engineer by education and I worked in corporate America for five years before I formed my own company, right? And it's easy to get a big head. You think you're educated and you go into corporate America and you're sitting at your office and you have a secretary that takes care of you and all. And it, it's easy for these kinds of things to blow up in your head and, not and sit back right and then you sit back for a minute and i remember when all these different things came to me and and you start asking yourself the question uh for me one of the times that it started and notice i said one of the times because it's many times it was riding uh driving through the hood one time and my car broke down and realized that the only that these guys came out and they knew what to do and they could help me and i was a fish out of water right here it is i couldn't do a damn thing and they knew exactly what to do and then i kind of per- I, I i i created started to talk about you know somebody's worth if you put uh, by by how they can survive on their own right and what you find is the people best at for survival And I repeat, the people best apt for survival. So we're working class people, man. You know, and you must become a working class folks. I mean, uh, working class people are the ones who make things happen. So I tell everybody that's that's around here. Look around. Those are the people that make this system go. And we have to start taking the mystique away from the industrialists. When they say, well, they, Donald Trump hired a lot of people. False. So let's not use Donald Trump. Uh, Getty uh, uh, hired a lot of people. I mean, uh, uh, offered a lot of jobs. True. But you know what? Without the jobs, there ain't no Getty. Without those workers, there ain't no Getty. There ain't no Ford. There ain't no any of those things. Until we, as I wrote this article called Asserting Your Worth. I want Americans, all of us, to start asserting our worth. I am waiting for when things hit that tipping point and every American say, we're going to show you what it's like. We're going to stop working for a week. Let me give an example. Look at what happened during the pandemic. What happened to oil? They had to give it away because they had to store it somewhere. They had to give it away. We, the people, have power. And what the, the, what the right and what the, uh, the neoliberals are trying to do to you is to de- deny, is, is to make you believe you are inherently weak 
and they are inherently strong when the opposite is actually the reality. Uh, close out for me, and uh, Augie, so I can get to Donald. Yeah, well, uh, like uh, people worry about this coup that Trump had. Well, people don't realize that's not the first coup the United States had. First mm-hmm. coup we had was in 1934, and yep. the leader of that was Prescott Bush. George yes. W. Smith, by the way, was the leader of that, where they tried to take over the government. And, and they got some generals control. involved, yeah. And uh, the one that they hoped to lead them was a Marine general. Yeah. And the Marine general refused to go along, and that's what ended it. But Prescott Bush was the leader. The DuPonts, all the billionaires, the one percenters, were behind it. They were willing to back it up financially. And there was a bonus army, and they were hoping to get the bonus army leader to go along with them. He would supply them the men. And then uh, the Remington Company would supply them the rifles. Uh, so all these guys, were we've already had more uh, than one coup attempt. The people and, don't and, realize. Right, and Augie, media. Augie, Augie, and there's something that's happening right now. You see how these polls are looking for for Trump. And by the way, you notice they're at 44%. None of it ever crosses 50%. But what you also notice is, all his people, they're trying to create an aura of inevitability. Because you create an aura of inevitability, then two things happen. Either you, you still lose, but people think you were cheated because, hey, we thought this is what it, things looked like. Or you, are, you think it's inevitable, inevitable and you just stay at home. And that is what we have to make sure doesn't occur. Augie, got to go to Donald. Give me a, a 10 second closer. Yeah, people, we got to be aware of what's going on. Uh, in 34, they controlled the media and uh, told people that was a hoax, that they weren't trying to take coup. And they control the media now. And slowly that box came where they took over the media slowly. That truth oh. didn't matter anymore. They could say whatever they wanted on the media. And that's what they're doing now. Augie, uh, thank you. Be- we're gonna we're gonna tear that oh. box open, Augie. We're gonna tear it open. Thank you, brother. Donald, come on in. 713-526-5738. Come on, people. Let me hear your voices. 713-526-5738. Come on in, Donald. Good morning, AW. How you doing? I am doing fine, my brother. Talk to me. Okay. The dictator is written in nineteen forty by a little dude with a funny looking hat and a black mustache and a cane. And the thing is that's when he all put that character on the altar to speak. And at the end of that black and white silent film is the first time he ever spoke. And I want you to listen to his speech that he said to the world. Now he was worldwide famous because they didn't have sound. So they didn't have to translate it, but you watch how he was persecuted after that minus a creator from the creation. And you can understand what the world will do to people. It'd be well, Charlie Chaplin. I'm sorry. I don't, uh, think, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I figured it was Charlie you Chaplin you were talking Chaplin, about. You could watch. Yes, sir. Okay, what's the name of the... What? information, but the dictator. If you watch that speech and listen to that speech, that is what we need today. Okay, and, and you said it's called The Dictator. It's so Charlie Chaplin in The Dictator. You don't want to look for that, baby. I better yes, write sir. that down. Same yeah, time I, period, 1940s. You got to look at it and see what's going on in the world. And then imagine that coming to light. Silent thank you. Speech. And what's All the right. impact? That's it, I am I'm, going to. All right, thank, thank you, brother. Thank you, Donald. Okay, uh, we're kind of low on calls this time around. What happened, my friends? Am I too boring for you this morning? Well, I'm going to get rid of the board. I'm, I'm going to play the seven-minute piece now. 713-526-5738. But here is a piece on Paxton and what he's doing to women. Remember, guys, you guys re-elected this guy. Check this out. Elections have consequences. And as we continue to elect in the state of Texas, troglodytes into office, people who care nothing about women, people who care nothing about humanity. This is what we get. I want you to listen to uh, this segment here on this woman in Texas who is pregnant with a baby that's not viable and what the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton 
the criminal in charge of the law in Texas, what's his intent? Listen to this. Then we'll take it on the other side. Very intrusive government. And that was our colleague Rachel Maddow with a frightening prediction on the night the Supreme Court overturned Roe, stripping away the constitutional right to abortion access. She was right. In the years since, Republican-led state governments have invented new and disturbingly intrusive ways to assert control over a woman's private medical decisions. And it's led to this. Texas resident Kate Cox, who is currently 20 weeks pregnant with a baby that will not survive, had to beg a judge today for a desperately necessary abortion in order to preserve her health, to keep her baby from suffering, and to enable her to have children in the future. Now, just let that sink in. A woman in a medical emergency had to beg a court for health care due to Texas's anti-abortion laws. And to be clear, it is, in fact, an emergency. Kate Cox's attorney noted in the hearing today, her health is so fragile that in the time since the case was filed on Tuesday and the hearing today, Kate had gone to the emergency room for a fourth time. The judge granted her request, noting on the verge of tears that, quote, the idea that Miss Cox wants desperately to be a parent, and this law might cause her to lose that ability, is shocking and would be a genuine miscarriage of justice. It remains to be seen if the state of Texas will fight the judge's order today, as they have every time court in that state has sided to protect women and their health and bodily autonomy. But in a statement today, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton issued what can only be interpreted as a threat to Kate and to her doctors. Quote, the temporary restraining order granted by the Travis County District Judge reporting to allow an abortion to proceed will not insulate hospitals, doctors, or anyone else from civil and criminal liability for violating Texas's abortion laws. This includes first-degree felony prosecutions and civil penalties of not less than $100,000 for each violation. The order does not enjoin actions brought by private citizens, nor does it prohibit a district or county attorney from enforcing Texas's pre-row abortion laws against Kate's doctor or anyone else. The temporary restraining order will expire long before the statute of limitations for violating Texas's abortion laws expires. That is the top lawyer in the state of Texas threatening a private citizen in a medical crisis, putting a bounty on the head of her doctors. So. You can get a clear understanding of what that would mean for her. This is what Kate has said about the horror she is currently living through. Quote, it is not a matter of if I will have to say goodbye, but when. I do not want to continue the pain and suffering that has plagued this pregnancy. I do not want to put my body through the risks of continuing this pregnancy. I do not want to continue until my baby dies in my belly or I have to deliver a stillborn baby or one where life will be measured in hours or days full of medical tubes and machinery. I do not want my baby to arrive in this world only to watch her suffer a heart attack or suffocation. I desperately want the chance to try for another baby and want to access the medical care now that gives me the best chance at another baby. Now, I want to tell you guys something about that. I, I cut it in uh, right at the, at the end of that for one reason here. Think about this. The state of Texas is telling you women, all my sisters out there, what you can and cannot do with your body, even if it means it's going to damage you permanently. This man, this criminal that runs the laws in our state, he is going to tell women, and you have elected him again, even with his criminal background, you voted for him again. Remember, what, what, what is it again, Howard? Vote, vote, vote. Get out there and vote. Well, yeah, get out there and vote, but vote correctly. All of us, if that woman loses her, her fallopian tubes, if that woman loses her uterus, remember, all of us who elected Ken Paxton bear responsibility for that. And remember, rich folks in this state, they don't have to worry about all these draconian laws that are passed in Texas. Because they can get on their private jets or they can get on their first class ticket and head off to, 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 to Mexico or head off to Guyana or head off to wherever to get what they need done, done. But it's those without mobility, 
the working class, the paycheck to paycheck, the poor to poor that has to live under the draconian laws being passed. It doesn't apply to the rich. That's why they don't care. They don't care. But anyway, I digress. I go to the phones. Let's go to Jim. Come on in, Jim. Say, uh, you know, I got my mailbox. I know the, the Democratic Party can't take sides when you got two Democrats running against each other. Says who? But my, well, normally they don't do that. I mean, the Republicans kind of do that with Trump, but... I don't know if they do that or not. I don't, well, you know. whenever, remember, let me, let, I like when people call this program and I'm going to let you finish your statement, but I want to correct you. On Tuesday, uh, Kim Og, uh, there will be a vote on Tuesday to admonish Kim Og right here in the Democratic Party by all precinct chairs who will attend. We'll see if it passes, but the fact of the matter is it is going to occur. So I just want to let you know that statement isn't quite very accurate is what a lot of people believe, but it's not quite accurate, my dear brother. Continue, please. Okay. Well, about the election with uh, Hightower and uh, Whitmire. Whitmire. Like yes. with High- Whitmire and uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, my mailbox was, was filled up with brochures from uh, Whitmire, Whitmire. Mm-hmm. but I well, I didn't get anything from Sheila Jackson Lee except a deal to have me do a, a vote by mail thing. But right. Yeah. I didn't, whether it was before well, the runoff l- after, I didn't get nothing from her. So well, what, let me, I didn't get that. Let me, you are so right, sir. You are so right. I mean, Whitmer had $10 million in the bank. I think uh, I think uh, uh, Sheila was looking for a prayer. I I can say that now. I think she was looking for you know in in these in these uh, elections where a lot of people don't show up, anything can happen. And the thing that happened to her, she got blown out, and she got blown out because Whitmer had a very well funded campaign, and he was in everybody's. I've gotten at least twenty pieces of mail from Whitmer. I got zero from, uh, yeah. and I'm in Kingwood. I got zero from, yeah. from her. Okay, so I mean, like, well, like, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm in a area where it's kind of, I guess, a swing area. You yes, know? sir. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. I do know what you mean. She would have, she would have really pushed to get votes in this area. You know, it's kind of like in the Heights right. area. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I think I think she probably didn't want to spend a whole lot of money, given that the the it was the, the, it seemed like the uh, many in the Democratic Party decided they were going to go quasi Republican this year, and that is what a lot of people don't understand. There are a lot of other factors that I don't have the time to go over right now, but uh, you're you're absolutely right, uh, Jim. Let me go to Arnold. Thank you so kindly for calling, Jim. Um, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Come on in, Arnold. How are you doing? Hey, how you doing? I'm doing uh, fine. Talk to me. So- yeah, uh, I mean, a uh, quick few things. Uh, the uh, as far as Sheila Jackson Lee and 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 Mayor uh, the with Mayor yeah, Whitmire, uh, he he. Uh, I, I I honestly, uh, yeah, Sheila uh, Jackson Lee. She didn't have any ground game at all. It was it was it was non-existent. I I didn't get any uh, mailers and. Tons for Whitmire as well. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, I mean, look at the district that he comes from as well. Uh, you know, a uh, bunch of refineries and whatnot. So, you know, that's where a lot of his money is coming from. And not, not, I mean, you know, we're Houston, so this is where the money is going to come from, right? Uh, that right. And, and, and medical and and uh, and and hospitals and. And, and all that so that, that that's what we got in houston and unfortunately and that's and and then unfortunately the turnout uh the turnout wasn't there at all either i mean houston we 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 got to do a better job of that you know that was uh that was a horrible turnout that we had as, as yeah. Houstonian, right 
Uh, well, we got to, we got to solve that problem, uh, Arnold. But anyway, give me your point, my dear brother, so I can get to Emmanuel. Well, uh, apologize, man. Uh, so when you were talking about the whole, uh, uh, or when you had that little deal with the abortion thing, uh, yes. and what's going on with this lady in the state, uh, real quick, uh, back in, of course, 1999, you know what happened? Columbine, the, the laws, uh, after that 2000 were zero tolerance of any type of weapon in school. And so, Year 2000 came, I was in school, had a little small knife. I was cutting some cardboard in the lunchroom, not thinking anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. I get expelled. I get expelled because of that policy, you know? And and that just kind of comes to show these laws that uh, man, these, these men create. Uh, and know, a consequence, a hey, Arnold, Arnold, let me let me interrupt you here, because I think I get the gist of your discussion and I need to go to other person. But I want to I want to give honor yeah, to what you're okay. saying. No, no, no. Wait, I want to give honor to something that you said that is so important. You had a pocket knife. You're cutting an apple. And because of the Texas laws that changed your entire trajectory, now you have something on your record that said you had a knife. Nothing negative that you intent or anything, but because of how the laws are written, you are forever scarred for something that has happened. Am I correct in the way I stated that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, Arnold, we'll finish. Arnold, call me back earlier the next time, please, so that we can have a longer conversation. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Let's go to Emmanuel. Right. Emmanuel, come on in. Hey, good morning, hermano. How are you? Buenos dias, mi hermano panameño favorito. Talk to me. Hey, hey listen. The, the, the Mahomian way, I've started it. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was very clear. Very clear. And I believe I called in several weeks ago, and I told you that this guy with my have been working the grounds right. long time. Yes. Long time. And now that he had $10 million in the bank to spend and campaign, he was working the grounds very long time. And I told you the last time I spoke to you that the first time I heard of him was in Third Ward. Right. Right. Third Ward. What? When I heard right. of with my right. from, from African American people. Right. So it's not that he had ten million dollars to beat her. She's a good person and she meant well. Just that Democrats in Houston fall asleep for right. a long well, time. Hermano, let me just say that the you can have a great ground game under two circumstances. And as a political activist, I can tell you, I'm out there on the ground a whole lot. Many times I'm in the Latino community using, you know, you tu sabes por qué, out there uh, trying to get people to come out and vote. But here, here is the, here is the thing, right? Uh, money, a, a ground game requires one of two things that you're so popular that you have a lot of people who want to work for you. That is how, Bernie Sanders started it before he started collecting all that $2.99 or 27 or $2.70, I don't know, $2.70. I mean, he had the grassroots who fell in love with him and were willing to go out and work no matter what, without pay, whatever what. Likewise, Obama, when Obama just started and he put his book out there and he had the students wanting to go out there and work for him. Now, Sheila Jackson is a is an old stalwart that's been around for a long time that in many ways, uh, even though she hasn't lost her way with her particular uh, insular community, uh, has not generated the kind of uh, passion for a, 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 a grassroots that can be free. When I say free, I mean that people want to work for you. In the case of, uh, in the case of Whitmer, he didn't have to have people want to work for him. He could pay people to work for him. And that's what he did. So that's why you saw that big ground game from Whitmire. And that's why you didn't see a big ground game from a Sheila Jackson Lee. Continue, my brother. But, uh, and, and to me, I had noticed a long time that rumors of bad behavior are faster than fire. Yes. They move faster than fire. But yes, let me. Yes. Some, some 
I, I want to, hermano, hermano, I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. I got to go to Brian, but I want to put something in people's ears right now that based on what you just said, rumors can move fast, no doubt about it. But in a society that isn't not yet, you know, I don't like, I'm not a, a, you know how I feel about race. Everybody knows I don't believe in race, but we are in a racialized society. But when w people look for a reason, uh, a reason for, a, let's say, a black woman like Sheila Jackson Lee, it's easy for these types of rumors to stick because it fits the implied stereotype. And that is what also happened with Sheila. Continue. Yes, oh. I agree with you. I, I oh. agree with you. And, uh, but I also believe, I also believe that if she, she knew about these rumors, Many, 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 many years, and and, yes. eh, eh, and, and and I can't go into several things personalmente porque yo, uh -huh. yo, yo, I know about it personally, but right. I'm not going to right now, especially over the air. All so, right, but it, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, I gotta go. Long time. Thank you, brother. I gotta go. Sí, Call sí, me sí, earlier, papá. please. Llámame más temprano, hermano. Oh, All right, let's go to Brian. Oh, no. Uh -huh. Gracias. Ciao. All right, come on in, Brian. Yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, something one of your callers said Friday about uh, working at BP and someone paid him four thousand, and yes, his go employer ahead. paid fifteen thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see this totally different than he does, and that's what separates me from him. I got a four thousand dollar job. If that man didn't have his contacts and make fifteen thousand, I don't make four thousand. I make zero. Right. And, and, and let me tell you, and that is exactly how a slave thinks. You're exactly correct. In, and I see exactly what you're saying. But that's exactly how, hold on, Brian. That is exactly how a slave thinks. That's what they teach us to think. And you, you are the impersonation of how that thinking process works. Somebody that has to do nothing but just has contacts, that's good enough because he is massa. We'll talk about it later, Brian. Let's go to, ja to Howard. Come on in, Howard. Hey, I was just thinking about the uh, Whitmire Lee mayoral race. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the exact same thing as we saw with Trump and Hillary Clinton. Yes. Trump said, we're going to make America great again. Hillary said, I like puppies. <laughs> I love you, said, Howard. Howard, you nailed it. <laughs> Whitmire says, I'm going to fix the roads. Sheila Jackson Lee said, you're crooked. Oh so, God! You know, she just she didn't run a really good campaign. That's all. I agree, but Howard. Love you, brother. Hey, uh, Jack, give me a quick close. We don't have time, but give me a quick one. Ten seconds. We have simply let our corporations become too big and powerful. Those rats. Those rats. Hey, guys, listeners, callers, everybody. Love you all. Thank you for calling. Thank you for listening. My name is Egberto Willis. Thank you, Jack and Howard. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you guys know how I end this. Baby, I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.